Okay, good afternoon everybody. My name is Paul Muir. I'm the president of North America for Mobidio and I'm delighted to be on stage with Luis Labella, who is the president of Delec US Holdings Refining Division. Um, it's only a 30 minute presentation, which is about half the time I normally take, so we're going to go pretty quick and I'm going to try and give as much time as I can to Luis, who's got a lot of interesting stuff to say from an owner perspective. <clears throat> um, some of you all have heard of Gartner, they're a big, a big credible analyst, and what you see on the screen right now is 2019 top excuses for not digitalizing. Okay? Uh, the one I've chosen to highlight is lack of education. So, welcome to Connected Plant. Uh, hopefully, you're going to learn a lot more about digitalization, uh, or what I like to talk about is just connectivity and connecting things over the next two or three days and go back to the, back to the ranch more informed and more confident to move forward. Um, the other thing I just heard from, from um, Gartner a couple of days ago was that they see the market as, 20, as 2017 and, uh, 2018, 2019 were years of hype and experimentation. But they're seeing real businesses in 2020 getting directions from the top to do something. Don't just evaluate something. Recently at the ARC conference in um, Orlando, uh, a couple of major operators stood on stage and said they need to stop suffering from what they called POC purgatory, constant proof of concepts, right? Pick something and roll it out. But that's the top 100 excuses, should you be short of excuses. But I implore you to, to think about you know, what you're going to do for your business and get moving in the digital world. So digitalization is a huge topic, and I'm not an expert in all of it, but our little piece of digitalization is about people. It's about how do people continue to fit into a digital world. Now, I am a sort of tech guy, and if you look at the technology landscape over the last couple of decades in the process plant world, um, you know, we're really good at owning stuff, right? We're really good at knowing what we own. We've already got mature asset management strategies. We're really good at buying more stuff. We're really good at managing integrity and maintenance programs, and we're really good at tracking production. But when work has to get done, that's about people, and we are terrible at that, right? You know, we're going to be talking about turnarounds later, and it could just, just as well be a large capital project. We're talking about the productivity of thousands of people uh, impacting your, your turnaround or your, your capital project performance. And we're managing by walkie-talkies, yellow post-it notes, and whiteboards, right? So the missing piece I, I am proposing is people. If we can do a better job of managing people in a digital world and be pragmatic and realistic about their role and continued existence, there's a lot of value and there's a lot of low-hanging fruit, which you'll see shortly. So one of the big things to realize about digitalization is it can and must change things. There's no point in being digital. There's no point in being connected and still doing the stuff you've always done, right? So there's a, few, there's a handful of examples up here, but one of the first things that changes is the speed of information flow. In a digital world, information is available instantly everywhere. Now that means the boss gets the bad news exactly the same time as you do, and you need to look at your management processes to account for that readiness of access of information. And we need to get to a world where information is believed by everybody to be consistent and true. Right? No longer are we dealing with personal information stores and arguing about the truth. The other thing we get is a ton of data. I mean, people will talk about IoT and, and computing at the edge, et cetera, collecting a lot of data. And that's cool. We do get a lot of data. But it raises the question, what's the question, right? And in my experience over the last couple of years, I've seen a lot of companies collecting data, but they don't have the people in their organization to analyze that data, and they haven't thought about what the questions are. So when we talk about analytics and all the rest of it, I think the pragmatic view would be, what is the question? Now, the biggest opportunities are to remove what I call friction. So there's two, my two favorite words this year are connected, particularly like the name of this conference, and friction. So what's friction in a digital world? Friction is unnecessary delay and complication and confusion and moving of information. And every time you feel yourself being frustrated by a lack of information or information a day later than you could have used it, that's friction. So we'll, we'll talk a bit later about some examples of that, but by eliminating friction or people-centric friction from the world, you're going to create a lot of value. Now, things like meetings. I love meetings. I like people. I like to innovate. There's lots of scope for collaboration. 
But in a digital world, we do not need meetings to talk about what we did yesterday. Nobody needs to show up and say, here's what I did on my summer holidays. The dashboards and all that kind of stuff are telling us what happened yesterday. So meetings are different. It's different people. It's forward-looking, and it's a very objective, data-driven, truth-based look at life. And again, things like reports. Who, who, who's seen office, uh, what's it called, Whitney? Office space. Have you all done your TPS reports, right? Nobody, no, nobody likes reading them and uh, writing them, and nobody reads them, right? So in a world, a digital world, you've got to rethink how you communicate up and down and sideways in your organization and what the impact of real-time information flow is. So I'm going to come on at the end and kind of sum up a little bit, but I'd like to hand over now to, to Lewis, who's going to take, take us through his experience in the last 18 months as he's gone and to start implementing a digital world. Lewis? So I know that there's uh, two times not to have a presentation, one right after lunch and the last one at the end of the day because I'm between you and a refreshment. So uh, I'm going to try to run through this pretty quick. I do want to, by a show of hands, how many people in the room has participated in one way or another in a turnaround? Okay. So the, the essence of you having to do a lot of work in a short amount of time and to be able to control that knowledge, right, of that activity is critical. So one thing in a turnaround world, especially in refining chemical plants, or steel mills, power plants, whatever you name it, there's questions that you always ask. Where are we from a management level, right? Do we know where we are? And then someone say, yeah, well, I think we're on schedule. Well, we're two days behind. How do you know? How do you know where you are, okay? What are the knowns, unknowns? That's critical, right? And how are you managing that? And what's the plan when you do have the unknowns and now they're known? And can we recover? And then that's a really cool, well, how do you know that we can recover? So I've been in the oil and gas industry for 30 years. I've seen multiple turnarounds in my career. Some okay, some really bad, few good. Because out of the hands that you raised, I'm, I'm kind of curious because we, we had some statistics that we looked at from our company. There's only 3% of the turnarounds that are executed are done well. On time, on schedule, right? On budget, no safety issues. And the most critical one that I think is zero leaks on startup. We've actually had uh, done a few uh, in my career that I've seen that actually happen. So how do you get there, right? So we did a workshop with uh, a group of people when we started to uh, engage with uh, Movideo, right? And we wanted to digitize the work process of our turnaround. So I got all my turnaround guys in the room together and we asked, how do you get the maximum productivity in the next 12 hours? And I just started asking questions. Now, uh, the guys raised your hand. How many of you actually participate in the execution part of the turnaround? Shift by shift, right? So what's the first thing you do when you show up? Most people said, the first thing I do, because I come ahead of the crew, is I go make a round. I go walk. I go look. I go see what's going on, right? Where, where, is, this, where is this piping job? Where is this pump job? Are we in the vessel yet? Do we have the blinds in? And all the superintendents and the foremen tell me they're going to make a round before the beginning of shift. I said, why? He said, well, I got to know where I got to start. So we wrote that down. So I asked him, I said, so what would be the best opportunity for you to know that you're going to have a good day? Well, I need to know when my permit's ready. I need to know the materials on site. I need to know the crew's here. I need to know the operations has it ready, right? So we started writing these things down, right? So as we started to integrate Mobidio into the P6, we built a process that would give us information to the crew coming in that everything was ready to work. He didn't have to go walk around. He picked up his tablet and he looked. And when he saw all green lights across all these activities, he knew which activities he was ready to work for the day and where he was going to start. Okay? How many in the turnaround organization, when you do find something in the schedule and it gets reported, 
right? You know about it three and a half to four shifts later. That's how it works. Exactly how it works, right? You find something out, you report it, shift change, they get it to the scheduler, scheduler goes back, he does his magic, he has to get it in there, comes out to the next three shift look ahead, might get adjusted, everything's moving. So the ability to react to something bad in the turnaround, you know probably three to four days into it. Is that efficient? Do you really think that's, that's the best way to manage it? So how can I, if you take a fighter pilot, a fighter pilot, excuse me, and he can fly a jet at Mach 2 or 3 above the ground, how can he do that? He has to have a lot of information really quick telling him how to make a decision. And that's what we're talking about, digitization, digital transformation, taking data and making decisions with it, managing with it. Okay, so the journey that we took, and I'm glad Paul spoke about culture, because I'm a 100% I'm a believer, and if you haven't experienced it, I'll challenge you, okay? But culture will kick the behind of strategy every time if you're not ready for it. I don't care, you can put the best plans in place, you can have the best, do the best things, but if you don't address the cultural issues and what you're trying to do, you will not succeed. So the first system we put in, we tried it. This is our third turnaround that we've actually used Mo Video. We just did one thing with it. We took the P6 schedule, we uploaded it in there, and we worked the turnaround traditionally out of P6, three shift look ahead, and everybody knows about four days into it, that's a big old chunk of paper that's worthless. It's laid, on the, it's laid on the shift table. Nobody really looks at it anymore. About two weeks in, we're not even doing it because we can't keep up with all the changes. Okay? So we just walked it from in a parallel space. And the guys were looking at it, and they were kind of, yeah, this is really cool. I see some good charts, but I don't trust the data. Culture. Culture. Okay? The next turnaround we did, we put a little bit more into it. We said we're gonna, we're gonna activate it a little bit further. We're gonna put inspection in there. We're gonna do uh, pre-shift look ahead. And they tried to execute it, they got right up to the day and they says, oh, we don't feel comfortable. We're gonna go old school, okay? Third turnaround. I got a group of people in. We started about 10 months out. We brought all the guys in the room together and we start training, and we start talking, and we brought the operators in the room. We brought the maintenance guys in the room. We brought all the shift foremans in the room, and we start showing them the screens and how we're gonna do it, how we're gonna track it. So think about it. Now, I've got a P6 schedule loaded up in Mobidio that I'm tracking on the shift. My updates are getting updated as they happen. I can go back to the war room and look at a screen and know exactly the activities that started today, when they started, and if there was a delay, I see it. And at the end of the shift, you come in and you have a shift change. There's no more shift change where the guys come in and say, well, I worked on Exchanger 201, uh, 210, and 211, but we didn't get permit for 432 and 433. You got to move out the next shift and you write it down on the board, right? And then everybody's shuffling papers and they're trying to go adjust. You come into a room and you look at a screen and it says, okay, this is the work got done. Now, contractor A, why didn't you get these two exchangers? And they go, oh, well, we couldn't get a permit. Well, wait a minute. If you slip to this screen, it says you got a permit. There was no delay code that told me that you didn't get a permit. So why didn't you get to it? Different conversation, totally different conversation in the shift change meeting. There's no more passing of why things happen. There's no more drama. Because there are a lot of times you get in a turnaround and a shift change meeting, there's a lot of drama. We can't get a permit from operations. Contractor never showed up. Y'all lived it. If you raised your hand out there, you've lived this, right? You've been a part of that. So it eliminates all the need to have all this when you have the data and you can make instant decisions, right? So as we went through this process, this now is the big spring turnaround. This is what the shift handover meeting looks like. There's no three shift look ahead paper that we're shuffling. There's no wall charts. 
There's no list. There's no whiteboards. There's no one coming in 30 minutes before and say, this is the things that I got done today. Right? It's all done live from the field during the shift. So you actually know what you're working on. So we took it one step further, right? We actually split out a team of people that was taking items, activities that were supposed to be worked during the beginning of the shift that didn't get worked, making sure that all those green lights were ready for the next shift. Okay? We actually had trackers, we called them, in the field that had the ability to shift activity 12 hours in the P6 schedule, real time. Think about it. I don't have to have a scheduler. I can say that, you know what, that job's going to be delayed, we're going to do that on night shift, move it to night shift, and it's there. Okay? The resources get reloaded, the materials make sure the material's there, and they track it. Benefits, real time, visibility, right? You see it actually as it's happening. You've always compared your baseline to actual. You can see it, it adjusts every day. You can see if you're not making progress. Faster updates than the P6 schedule. Like I said, you can have it by the end of shift. You know everything the activity was supposed to start. You know what activities did start. And you know why they didn't. You didn't have resources. It wasn't ready. We delayed a permit. Whatever it is. You're able to adjust and move. You got better internal communications across the site and all the way up to upper management. I looked into Mo Video every day from Brentwood, Tennessee on my turnaround at West Texas. I flipped through every screen they were looking at. During the shift change, I could see what they were looking at. I could set my own filters. I could look at the data how I wanted to look at, and I asked good questions. You also see, and I talked about these, ability to shift resources very quickly. You can eliminate the bottlenecks, and you have the faster shift handover meetings. Matter of fact, we talked about next time, we might even remove the tables and just have a stand-up meeting. And you go through your data, boom, boom, boom. So where are we heading with this? Part of the things that we want to do is we want to, we want to move this into capital projects. There's no difference, in my opinion, a capital projects is the same thing as a turnaround. It's just executing a different frequency, right? So why wouldn't we do this? Why wouldn't we track how we execute a capital project, right? Get the, get the productivity from shift to shift like you would during a turnaround, okay? We're going to integrate everything into it. So it's all in one stop shopping. I can see everything. When the guys badge in the gate, right? All the contractors, the resources, the headcount badges in the gate. They start showing up on the bar charts. I've got need for eight welders, seven showed up. I got 22 pipe fitters, 18 showed up. I had eight boilermakers, 12 showed up. And I see it as they come in the morning and it gets updated. As the material is received into the warehouse through SAP or whatever, you get it, you see, hey, the, the shipments I had, we had for this job, these activities just turned green because they just showed up. We're ready to work it. Move it to the next shift. We have an opportunity to look at this as daily maintenance. Y'all know that. It's the same thing. It's just a different frequency of how you manage and what you do. And then we're looking at potentially running uh, how we're going to do this for Operations, right? For shift handover, for production handover. What are the activities we have from one day to the next? It's a different mindset on how to execute a turnaround. Totally different mindset. I had guys in their room that had done turnarounds for 30 years. And I'm asked them to look at a tablet now. Not a three shift look ahead. It's different. I asked them to believe the data. It's different. Trust the data. Make the decision off the data. So uh, I'm just going to wrap slides. The, the turnaround event that Lucy's talking about is actually going on right now and I've got some data from two weeks ago and I've got some data from two days ago and you can see the trends that's happening. This is a popular kind of analytics thing. That's a heat map. Many of you will know that. The size of the squares is the size of the problem and the colors the status. So that's a real quick way of drawing your attention to the things you need to look at. Right? We've got two large light colored squares on the left hand side. Those are work packages. So we're halfway through a turnaround, nobody's started those big things, right? There could be bodies buried in there, right? Why are we not doing that? Um, here we are two days ago, you'll see the same heat map, we're almost finished, there's a couple of light colored boxes, we're getting close to start up. 
The, the other thing he talked about there is the burn rate, and that's changing every day. The, the curves are changing every day. What was the original plan? Where are we today? How do we compare to yesterday's plan, and how do we compare to our original plan? And this stuff, you can click on it, and you can drill right down. And if you're a super high-level executive, there's four numbers on the bottom right-hand corner, that's all you care about, right? So that you can go onto this for months and tune into it, but there's a lot of real-time data there. The other one that caught my attention was this one, which is uh, delay reasons. The pie chart on the right-hand side, there's a, there's a little purple segment at seven o'clock. What that is, is um, uh, poor availability of specialist equipment. Well, two weeks later, look, that's four times the problem. Now, what does that tell us about our planning process for next year, right? We can now look at how that changed over the life of the turnaround and say, what can we do better in the supply chain to make sure that we're, we're estimating the right, the right things? So looking at how data is in the moment is important and how data is trending over time is equally important. That's the money we're spending by change order right now by unit, right? So we can look at the manpower, the earned, the earned hours and all the capital expenditure. Paul, well, before, before you leave that slide, let me tell you another thing. Discovery, huge impact, right? Discovery. We track the moment in Mobidio, the moment that the inspector found a RR, repair request, to the time it got through the, the planning team, got estimated, and got put back in the schedule every day. And you knew how many was added that day, how many got moved through the process, how many got added to the schedule, and where you were. It was another page that came up. And if you ever have had the opportunity to, to, to engage and have a bad discovery, right, a lot of attention gets, gets drawn to that. But what about those nickels and dimes that you leave, no one looks at right there to the end? And it's that one vow that keeps you from starting up because you needed to change it, and you, you, you can't introduce anything into it until you do it. So the so way to, to look at that map is you can prioritize that map however you want to. You can look at it from priority ones to discovery to, to all the way to equipment type. It's the data. You can spin it, flip it however you want to. So everybody in the room looked at it a little bit differently. Inspection looked at it one way. The mechanical people looked at it another way. The electrical people looked at it another way. It was tailored to them. Thanks, Lewis. So um, where to start, right? I, I kinda, my guidelines would be the following. There's three buckets. The first bucket in human digitalization is about individuals and teams in the field. Where are the opportunities to, to make a guy, girl more productive right now? And in team sports like turnarounds or construction, it's more about connected teams than connected workers. Connected workers is a thing, right? There was a presentation an hour ago about Google Glasses and all that. But the game changer is really when you've got to get people to work together to achieve things. This is not cable TV guy, right? This is not individual contributors. This is teams of crafts working together. So look at that individual productivity, and that may be Google Glasses, et cetera. The next bucket to look at is be selfish. What do you need as a manager to be better at what you do? The average agent here looks to be, you know, I don't know, 51 and a half, something around there, right? The benefit of being 51 and a half and having the gray hair is we've got some intuition. But the more data we can get, the more accurate our intuitive decisions are. Lewis actually talked to me about better data, better quality decisions, and a higher expectation of precision outcomes. Right? So by all means, use your experience, use your gut, use your female intuition, but you know your data-backed intuition. And then the third bit is this innovation thing, right? We do all of this, and there's more data than you could ever imagine. So we're now in a position to sit down, catch your breath, take two weeks off work, come in and have a data-driven lessons learned session where we look at what were the delays, what were the discoveries, how did contractor A compare against contractor B in terms of productivity and quality, et cetera. So we've now got a whole lot of ability to, to innovate. And uh, I think we've got one minute for this. I was at the AFPM conference in Dallas last January, February, and there was a speaker from um, Detroit, and he was one of these entrepreneurial guys, and he was talking about one of his friends in Detroit who had had various failed businesses. And he had two months mortgage payments left in his personal checking account, and he needed to start a new company. So he thinks, I need a business idea, and he thought, what about craft beer? Yeah, too many people doing that. What about craft whiskey? Great idea. Takes 12 years though, eh? and I've got two months mortgage payments left. So 
If you want to know how to make Scotch whiskey, and I have no idea how you make bourbon, don't drink it, right? If you want to know how to make Scotch whiskey, you can go on to Google, right, and there, there you go, right? First, it's got to be made in Scotland, etc., etc. It takes 12 years. I won't read that out to you. But he didn't ask himself, this guy, how to make Scotch whiskey. He said, how can I make something that looks, smells, and tastes like Scotch whiskey in 60 days? And he got these big stainless steel drums and he got the wooden cask barrels and chopped them all up into little chips and put them in the stainless steel barrels. And he cycled the pressure in these vats over 60 days. And what he got at the end was something that looks, smells, and tastes like a pretty good scotch. He's now a millionaire, that guy, as a result. So when we look at analytics, figure out what the question is. And when you're figuring out what the question is, figure out what the right question is. Because it's not how you do it today digitally. It's why do we do it at all? Right? Justify every role and every process and every meeting and every report. And that's my little take on, on innovation. Ask the right question. So we're bang on time. Uh, for those that are visual learners, and that would include me, tomorrow morning at 7 and the next day at 7 o'clock, we're doing a full live simulation where you'll get to hold devices and see all this happening in real time. And we're doing free breakfast burritos. So I expect to see you there. At the back of the room, Whitney with the blue shirt is going to be registering people. We've got 16 people registered for tomorrow and only 30 burritos. So if you're not fast, you're last. So please be there. Now, with that said, I'm going to prove I'm pragmatic and we're going to have an analog Q&A session with no Slido. So if anybody's got any questions, please holler. One in the front. Well, I don't think there's a detriment to collecting data. I mean, storage is cheap. I think the question is, you know, how many KPIs can you run your business by? It's, got, it's getting down to a manageable number of questions. There's no point in trying to run a business with 68 KPIs on everybody's dashboard, right? You know, so I think it's the volume of metrics, not necessarily the volume of data would be, would be my view. Which is good old-fashioned business stuff, right? I mean, before all this digitalization, nobody said, you know, take it easy next year. We all want better, faster, cheaper, right? So it's the same questions, but just get different ways of get, getting the data to, to back it up. So don't think that digitalization changes the basic business premise, which is more product at a lower cost, sell it at a higher price, and don't hurt anybody, right? So, you know, that, that's, that's, the business questions are the same, but you now have a, a granularity uh, that you have data that you can get to and you can get to quickly. Nobody's got to transcribe timesheets into a spreadsheet, you know, I mean, it, um, so it changes the access, but it's about limiting the questions, not the volume of data, in my opinion. Any more questions? One in the middle. My question is for Luis. So when Della implemented Mobidio, was it performed by your staffers or was there an outside facilitator? So for the first one, because it was new to us, it was an outside, right? and we just kind of watched. The second two, it was inside. Uh, we put a team together. Uh, actually, I hired a guy and said, hey, I want you to be the guru, right, and learn it and, and understand it. And he taught and trained everybody. So now we, we supplemented with some external contractors because we didn't have enough training of the trackers. Now that we've done it three times, we have enough internal resources to execute it ourselves. Any more for before beer? Okay, Lewis is going to be with us about another hour and a half before he gets on his private jet and jets back to Nashville. And uh, I'm going to be here for a couple of days. Um, but we've got a stand through in the exhibition. We'd be happy to talk to all of you all there. Thanks a lot for listening. Thank you. <clears throat>